Good day. In this lecture, we will discuss about the introduction on big data analytics. So, the contents for this lecture will come from data science and big data analytics, discovering, analyzing, visualizing, and presenting data by EMC Services, uh, copyright by Wiley. So, the contents are about big data, what are the different types of data structures, what drives data analytics, and what does a data scientist uh, should be, so a profile of a data scientist. We will also discuss about data analytics life cycle and an example of uh, an example application of that life cycle through a case study. So first, what is big data? So in today's world, we have a lot of information. They come from our mobile devices, from our posts in social media, video surveillance, CCTV, uh, CCTV records, video records. We also have smart grids, uh, geophysical exploration data, data from uh, medical imaging devices, and the very large data on gene sequencing. Now, what those information are known as big data. So what are the characteristics of a big data or what specifically separates big data from just simply data? So we have three basic characteristics of your big data. First is, of course, a huge volume. And this volume is described as billions of rows or millions of columns. And aside from that volume, we also have complexity. So complexity of data type and structures. So when we say about that, it's the different variety of the new data sources, formats, and structures. So they can be uh, CSV files, they can be images, they can be... Um, uh, web pages, e uh, videos, images. So any digital traces left on the web and other digital repo repositories for subsequent analysis are also a, a data, recorded data. And the last characteristics of your big data is the speed. The so speed of the new data creation and growth. So not only does your big data must have a very large volume and must be made up of different uh, data types and structures, does the speed where new data is being created is also a characteristic of big data. So high velocity data with rapid data ingestion and near real time analysis. Example for that is your uh, the my day. Every day in Facebook, millions of people are posting my days, uh, and those are continuously cre creating a large amount of very complex actually data. So those are the three basic characteristics of your big data. Now, why is it important? L lately, uh, several industries have started exploiting the information from those big data. So, for example, credit card companies can monitor your purchase, the purchase of their customers, uh, the, the every purchase of purchase their customers make and can identify fraudulent purchases with a high degree of accuracy using rules derived by processing billions of transactions. So another one, mobile phone companies analyze subscribers' calling patterns to determine whether a caller's frequent contacts are on a rival network. If that rival network is offering an attractive promotion that might cause the subscriber to defect, the mobile phone company can proactively offer the subscriber an incentive to remain in her contract. So in the previous example about the credit cards, this one is helpful or beneficial to the customer. In the second example, this one is beneficial to the, the mobile company, to the uh, industries using that data. And then we have the social media. For example, Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. 
for these types of companies, social media is a free. So you it's free to download. You, you can freely post anything. So how how do you think these companies grow to become very large companies and very rich companies? What is their product? In part, basically their project per product is the data itself. Data itself is their primary product. The valuations of these companies are heavily derived from the data they gather and host. Basically, the data that you provide them is their product. And basically, they are selling this product. The data. People are posting the different types of posts, what posts they are, where do they come from, even the time you post them. They uh they sell this information to different other companies, and that is basically their product. So that those are just some example of industries gathering and exploiting data. We actually have many different uh, other industries. For example, in the in the field of medicine, uh the the recent drive if you remember from saint luke's hospital recently they wanted to uh they they have the initiative about personalized medicine so in personalized medicine they are going to need large amount of data for that particular patient uh, up to or including their genetic sequence so how do uh, the use of that information can be um can be applied to your uh, to the very specific uh, tailoring of therapeutic practices for that particular individual. So you will have a, a, a therapy that is specifically tailored for that patient that uh, that was uh, derived from exploiting the data derived of course from that patient. So that's that's another drive for big data. Now. We talk about large amounts of data and how they are used, but let's now discuss about the different data structures. So we have basically four types of data structures, but all of these can be um, summarized into two, the structured and unstructured data. But first, let's look at structured data. So structured data is data contained containing a defined data type, format, and structure. So example of that are CSV files, spreadsheet documents, SQL database. So basically, these are the data that have a specified column, column headers, and they are actually um, can be segregated uh, properly. You have rows and columns. Each, um, each information on your data can be segregated into specific columns. Now we have the semi-structured data. These are textual data files with discernible pattern that enables parsing. So example of that is your XML data files that are self-describing and defined by an XML schema. And then we have the quasi-structured data, another type of textual data, but this time it's a bit more erratic. The format is erratic and it can be formatted with a bit of effort and time. So for example, uh, web pages containing text. So you have a quasi-structured data here and what type of data can you do? So for example, if you can find a specific word in a, a page, in a web page, so you can actually apply a specific tool to look for a specific word on that text. So that's a quasi-structured data. And then finally, we have unstructured data, data that is inherently no structure, and these are uh, text, some, some text documents, PDFs, images, and video files. So this is an example of a structured data. So as you can see here, you have a lot of, you have rows and columns. So each column is specified by what type of information can be seen in each column. For example, number of meals served, the year, federal expenditures, etc. Now this is a semi-structured data. So it comes from this specific web page, but if you look at your source, this is a, uh, you can actually see the different um, they the the web page itself is segregated. For example, you have the headers, you have these uh, titles, etc. So the as you can see from the looking at the HTML code, 
source of this uh, web page the each part of this web page is actually structured in such a way that basically have a, a somewhat of a structure uh, it's this is different from the actually the fully structured data like table the, the ones in the tables in the previous example but in this case you can see uh, this is the header this is uh, this is a link this is a menu uh, a menu item etc now for the quasi structured data this is like uh, using google to search the internet so you are typing uh, keywords and the the program will search the database for the occurrences of those keywords and the most common occurrence will be shown on your page so basically that's those are your uh, quasi structured data so you have for example a wall of text you can find the specific type of word or several words on that text and then this is your unstructured data. A good example is a video. It's totally has no structure whatsoever. Another example is images. PDF file. Uh, basically, you in creation of PDF, you have, uh, especially for uh, the old style of PDF from before, you have, say, a semi-structured or quasi-structured data. When you render it to PDF, you are uh, locking it into a type of an unstructured data. Okay, so the, the, in the big data, how many, uh, what is the population distribution, let's say, for each type of data, data types. So you have the structured data, which is the least... Uh, least in basically population we have more unstructured data as compared to the structured data and in terms of their increase we have greater and greater increase in the unstructured data compared to the structured data and that is one of the challenges in data analytics is basically how do you use an unstructured data and extract information from those unstructured data. So drivers of data analytics in business. Business and politics are one of the most major economic drivers in data science, specifically uh, these large businesses and even some political campaigns uh, uh, just tend to uh, let's say hire the data scientist. So why do we need? Why do they need that to do that? So to optimize their business for operations. For example, when should they have their sales? What should be the optimum price? Where, uh, what should be done to get the optimum profit or more efficient operations? And also identification of business risk. For example, um, the, the customer churn or customer turnover, are there any frauds or what should be the default risk that should be um, basically risk assessment analysis. And then you have uh, predicting new business opportunities. So if there are any changes on the markets, what can you do? You, can you can enter a new market? You can start a new line? Can you upsell, cross-sell or get new customer prop? prospects so you can expand your business to another market and then another one is to comply with those or regulatory requirements so it's one of the more easier way to uh, actually monitor and audit your business whether you are actually compliant with the different laws and regulations uh, such as anti-money money laundering law fair lending basel 2 to 3 sarbanes oxley or sox now, previously, before the advent of data science, we have what you call the business intelligence. Basically, the intuition, well, exp either experience or intuition learned by the businessmen in running their business. So, in business intelligence, as you can see here, you have uh, explanatory versus exploratory approach and past versus future. So business intelligence is more of an explanatory. So when we say explanatory, this is 
um, this is not uh, how do you say that the business intelligence the in the explanatory approach this is more reactive to the any changes or stimulus rather than the exploratory which is proactive so typical techniques and data types used in business intelligence we have the standard and ad hoc reporting dashboard alerts queries and details as demanded and we also have the use of structured data basically excel spreadsheet files databases traditional sources and manageable data sets so the common question is what happened last quarter how many units sold so as you can see they are analyzing based on past uh, past information so uh, basically as i said this is more of a reactive so they are seeking to explain what went wrong after the fact that something had already gone wrong now in data science you have optimization predictive modeling forecasting and statistical analysis that's not to say that business intelligence has no forecasting approach but rather in data science we have a more uh, we can build more accurate models uh, to have a predictive, um, basically to forecast possible uh, events in the market. So they tend to use both structured and unstructured data, data sources and they can deal with very large data sets. And uh, the common questions are what if? what's the optimal scenario for our business so basically the, the outlook is futuristic so what will happen what will happen next what will happen in the future so those are one of uh, the differences between business intelligence and data science but that doesn't mean that business intelligence is basically inferior you also need to have a sense of business or business intelligence somewhat Okay, so this is a typical an, uh, architecture for an, uh, data analytics. So in the conventional sense for business intelligence, so you have your data sources, you generate Excel sheets or reports on that data sources. So uh, additionally, these data sources can also be stored in departmental warehouses so that they can be available to the analyst these analysts are usually um, well versed in business intelligence to tell you uh, what happened in the business using those uh, the, the uh, previous data or the data sources and then you have your data warehouses that um, shows uh, in the dashboards and reports and alerts circulated in the company now in data science you you make use of both the original data source you have your data warehouses, the departmental warehouses, as sources of your information. So you can actually have larger, larger amounts of uh, or more diverse sources of information. So data evolution and, and the rise of big data sources. So if you look at the timeline in the 1990s, uh, there was uh, it's, this is just the advent of the internet so the internet is there but it's not as uh, as ubiquitous at is now back then you need to have a, a, a telephone line and at in a pc to access your internet so most of the time the, the sources are from the oracle or the sap so some of you might no longer um, recognize some of these now in the advent of the the, the 2000s so we have the the, the emails uh, the the different microsoft offices and of course the in, the the internet has uh, changed from direct telephone lines to actually wi-fi but back then the the speed is in kilobytes per second so we have again in terms of data in the 1990s you have a terabytes that that is a total amount of uh, information found in the internet and then because computer become more widespread we have laptops and laptops have become a, a common commodity 
that uh, and we have Wi-Fi, so you no longer have to connect to limited number of phone lines to access the internet. So there's uh, there you also can see there's an increase in the the volume of information, and uh, the information in internet can be measured in petabytes. And then in the 2010s, you now have your smartphone. The smartphone basically revolutionized the internet in such that instead of having to open your bulky laptops in, and connect to the Wi-Fi just to access the internet, you can just look in your handheld devices and access the internet from there. So you have a mini computer within your smartphone. And that actually caused the basic explosion of data. So you now have exabytes uh, the volume of information become very very large actually exabytes ne we are nearing the limits of this one especially now in the 2020s so again sharp increase and those information usually comes from youtube the, the sms the different social media wikipedia this is from medicine by imaging videos etc Okay, so the, this is the emerging big data ecosystem. So in, in the current um, scenario that we have, so we have our data devices that allows us to access the internet. So we have your uh, cell phones, the GPS devices, MP3 players, ebooks. Well, basically it's around uh, the 2010s. Then the smartphone right now, which is basically all four or five of these combined. You have cable TV, ATM, credit cards, the PC, RFIDs, video surveillance, and medical imaging sources. These are data devices that allows us to generate the data. And those data can be used by the government, the, uh, the medical uh, industry. Of course, especially for the medical uh, diagnostic services, you have the internet retail markets, the financial markets, and of course, phone and TV services. So this, um, this information are stored as your websites. This can be catalog ops, list brokers. Uh, basically, these are different um, information that are used by law enforcement, media, the different banks, delivery services, you have your, these are the data, data users and buyers. So basically, you have your data devices, which are collected in the government, the internet, and the different um, fields that are uh, deposited into different websites, information brokers for the case of the Facebook, IG, and uh, Twitters and other um, aggregates, uh, data storage or data aggregators that are used by your uh, data, data users. And these are the media, the law enforcement, the different banks, delivery services, marketers, employers. So those are basically the, how data is being moved around in our society. So a data scientist, so considering all this amount of information that the, the speed of the, that is this information is being generated, as well as the, um, the use, the driving force, why we need to have this data. So we need to have a data scientist, of course, to bridge the gap between what, uh, how to use this data and uh, put it into good use so the expertise basically you have a technical expertise it must be a quantitative knowledge statistics basically it must have enough curiosity and creativity to extract structured or information from unstructured data it must be able to communicate your uh, your results as well as form collaborations with other data scientists and other people involved in your specific project for example and skeptical so you must be able to check whether uh, your data source is actually reliable so this is the data analytics life cycle 
So, this is basically how you do a particular study or this is how um, data analytics is done. So, first you have your discovery phase. You must first uh, know what information you have and what, in what question or what information you can extract from your raw data. So, uh, from the discovery to the next step, you must know if you have enough information to draft an analytic plan and share for peer review. So, discovery is to gather information and data and to frame your uh, question or your hypothesis. And then, data preparation. So, from those gathered data, you, can, you must be able to clean them and uh, segregate them properly. So, do you have enough good data quality, enough good quality data to start building your model? So, cleaning the data that you gathered and you start with model planning. So, for model planning to model building, do I have a good idea about the type of model to try? So, can I refine the analytic plan? So, in this part, this is basically, um, as you can see there, feedback arrows. So, you can plan a model, you build the model. If you uh, if you are not yet satisfied, go back, to, go back to model planning or even going back to data preparation to extract more information. And so, um, until you, f you have your model that is robust enough, and um, you can be basically, uh, you have enough information to conclude. And after that, you need to communicate your results. And those results uh, can be used by, again, those data buyers that, are, uh, that can be used to create new policies, uh, to alter a certain course, to create a new business opportunities, etc. So basically, the results is implemented in the operation in this stage. So you implement it in real life. So this is a big data architecture for now casting and forecasting social and economic uh, changes. So this uh, this image is obtained from big data sources and methods for social and economic analysis published in Technological Forecasting and Social Change by uh, Desamparados Blasquez and Joseph Dominic. Now, as you can see here, you have your governance layer, the data analysis layer, and the persistence layer. So you have your, basically, in this um, module, so this is for now casting and forecasting social economic changes. So in today's society, so what can be what can be observed or what can be uh, deduced or how can we predict what will the future, what will be the future trends for the case of business, etc. So you have the different applications. So data input coming from the different applications, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, or even Wikipedia, or even the different websites. You have official, official documents and other sources from Google, GPS, etc. So those data are processed and can be integrated. So you the data integrated, so data integration, data preparation, data analytics, and results. So basically, this is your uh, the like the data analytics that we discussed before, and then you put those you have those output. Now in this data analysis layer, this is closely linked to your governance layer. So you archive, you audit, you get your results, you have your different uh, modules to actually take a check the quality of this data analysis layer. Then you have the persistence layer. This basically uh, serves as a storage of your uh, data. So let's move on to a certain case study. So to look at how your data analytics goes, so how does a particular data science uh, study goes. So this is uh, from variantsexplained.org. This is a case, a simple study or text analysis of Trump's tweets to confirm uh, text analysis of Trump's tweets confirms he writes only the angrier Android 
half. So this is from the different tweets by uh, Donald Trump. Uh, this was uh, during the 2016, so way back uh, before and after the 2016 election. So the the if you look at our faces, but by the way, uh, we I have the source here. So this is the if you want to read further on the information in here. So this is the website. Now we have the different faces in the previous example. So let's look at how those faces are applied here. So phase one discovery. So what are the information that we need? So it's about the different tweets of Donald Trump. So we need to have a proper framing of the question. Actually, this is one of the most important steps. You need to have a proper question. So the, the case here is that a quote from Todd Vazili, every non-hyperbolic tweet is from iPhone, which is made by his staff, and every hyperbolic tweet is from Android, which is personally from Donald Trump. So, from this question, you have a hypothesis that tweets from iPhone and Android come from two different people and that Donald Trump tweets uh, from your, sorry, it's Android. Now, uh, you have your question, you get your data. So, your data from, of course, these are tweets, so Twitter. So, in this, in his study, David Robinson uses uh, the Twitter package. So, he wrote this study, or he did this study using the R programming language. So, he got the data, he cleaned it, extracted tweets from iPhones. Uh, you have, um, basically, this is a quasi-structured data. Uh, you have your, from this data, you can get whether it's from iPhone, Android sources, from Twitter itself. So, you can also segregate the tweets from the time of they posted. And then on phase three, it's model planning. So, the sources of the tweets versus time of posting and content may point to two different individuals. So, you look at the time of posting and the content of the tweets uh, that come from the two different sources, the Android or the iPhone, and you build your model. So whether the source of the tweets vary with time, Trump, which uh, basically the tweets that come from Android uses quotation marks because it was known that Trump retweets manually and he uses quotation marks to indicate that it's, it's basically he quoted from another person. And if it's the staff from the iPhone, the staff tend to, to have more images and links on his tweets. So there's also a difference in their tendency to use words, which reflects the temperament of the person uh, composing the tweet. So from the temperament itself, you can deduce you have two different people based on the uh, word usage. And of course, you need to check whether this model you have is robust. And then communicate your results. So basically, the, the way he communicated his results is actually to publish it on his personal website. Now, this is the raw data. Not exactly the raw data, but basically um, a graph of the... Basically, he just segregated the tweets uh, that come from Android or iPhone and when these tweets were posted. So from here, you can see a clear delineation. So you have Android tweets early in the morning and late in the night, whereas your iPhone tweets are from uh, basically the whole day. So as you can see, we can say that uh, the person tweeting on Android is tweeting before and after his office hours and the person on iPhone are tweeting during his office hours and sometimes in the night. So it could be two different people or it can be just the same people but from this model alone, it, it, it is basically inconclusive. Now, whether the tweets start with question mark or and also this one here is if you have a pictures or link in your tweets so from the android you have picture almost no picture tweets so mostly text tweets 
uh, in a very small amount of pictures in the tweets whereas your iPhone you have a large amount of pictures or links in the tweets now in the usage of quotation marks Android uh, basically you have quoted uh, in the Android you have uh, quoted quotation marks so basically just look at the blue ones so you have a large amount of um, quoted tweets from android and a very small amount of quoted trips tweets from the iphone so from the usage the one on iphone tends to use quotation mark uh, sorry the one on android tends to use quotation marks but on but doesn't include pictures or links whereas the one on iphone it has pictures and links but has very small usage of quotation marks and then for the word usage so for the word usage you have a tendency this is basically uh, a normalized uh, data okay so these are the different word usage for the android and the iphone so mostly hashtag with the iphone and this is from the android so you have uh, certainly um, very temperamental words badly crazy weak so this is a bit of a subjective how would you know a temperamental word but um as you can see here the, the significant amounts of the usage of these words in the Android versus this amount of words in your iPhone. So this is basically the sentiment of the tweets based on the uh, words. So this application of another model to get uh, a sentiment, so negative, disgust, sadness, fear, anger, anticipation, based on the word usage. So in here, percent increase on Android rel rel relative to the iPhone. So in terms of joy, it's mostly neutral for Android and iPhone. So as you can see here, as you move, as you look at the more negative. Uh, sentiment so negative disgust and sadness these are more prevalent on android versus on the iphone anticipation surprise trust and positive sentiments almost no difference so these are error bars and these are the mission so almost no difference between the iphone and the android and you have a more negative sentiments on the android so these are another uh another view of this previous uh, bar graph a uh, uh, line chart from the previous slide so these are what you uh, these are the sentiment the words used and the sentiment associated so as you can see here anticipation uh, well because of the usage of just tomorrow and winning you have a large amount here in the iphone usage but anyway let's look at the negative sentiments so the iphone almost has no sadness sentiments the only word that describes an anger in iphone is crime which depending on the usage can may or may not express anger well personally what i think and then for the terrorist uh well terror but terror is well you can incite fear in a sense i'll give you that so liar and winning so basically this uh liar yes is discussed but winning is that uh, a sentiment uh, a word that describes sen uh, the sentiment of this anyway this is from his model and then you have the surprise so as you can see most of the negative sentiments come from android so basically from here he concluded that again which is the title of his um, case study he confirms that he writes only the angrier tweets on the android half and it's basically coming from trump himself okay so this is the end of this uh, lecture so have a nice day